In the last video, I described the number go up thesis and how I do not ascribe to it and believe that there is actually another description of the pattern that is taking place. And I want to share that with you. So the last video, we talked about the number go up thesis. The video before that, we talked about utility. And so utility is going to be an important part of actually understanding the thesis that I actually am operating on and that I think is a better description of what we've actually seen happen in the space in terms of the pattern of behavior. So we're embodying this pa pattern of behavior currently, but nobody's really articulating it. And that's okay because that's usually how these things happen. That first it's embodied and then the thesis is actually a, a description of the pattern that's taking place. And so that's what I'm going to attempt to do uh, in this video. So let's uh, talk about, just go back through the number go up thesis and what it is. It's about Bitcoin's idea that the Bitcoin price relative to the dollar, that is the price in dollars of 100 million Satoshis, the base unit of Bitcoin, that would be one Bitcoin or one BTC. And the number go up thesis, and it's held by the BTC maximalists, and it's generally why people are buying Bitcoin. The idea is the number will always go up. The price of Bitcoin relative to the US dollar is always going to go up. And the reason why it's always going to go up, as according to the thesis, is there is a finite supply of Bitcoin. This is questionable, but we're going to go with this as it's part of the thesis. There is a finite supply of Bitcoin, and someday Bitcoin will be the currency that is used by everyone in the world. So therefore, what you can do if you want to know what will be the final US dollar value of one Bitcoin is you take the total supply of currency in the world, the US dollar value of it, and you divide that by 21 million. And the idea is that that will give you the price of one Bitcoin if every single person in the world is using Bitcoin as currency. And as we discussed in the last video, you can go and watch why there's an internal contradiction there. The actual way that this has actually played out, and so this is the actual thesis that I am operating under, and it has to do with utility. And it goes like this. The price of the most useful chain, that is the most useful native currency, will necessarily, all things being equal, be the lowest of all similar chains. Okay, so what does this mean? What does this mean? Okay, so what we talked about in terms of utility is, utility is the capability of the network to be used as a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And this is how we see these networks being used to varying degrees. And we're saying all things being equal. So one of the things about these systems is that they can be forked. So you can have systems that are virtually mirrors of each other. So this is what you have whenever you have a Bitcoin fork. So certainly in 2017, when BTC and BCH forked, on that first block, when they forked, they were fundamentally, they had the same history and many of the same rules. So they were in many ways mirrors of one another. So much so that if Satoshi Nakamoto comes back today, he can spend the coins that he had mined, and he can spend them on either BTC or BCH, or eCash, or BSV, okay? So that history is still there, and these are competing chains. And now what you'll notice is BTC, BCH, eCash, and BSV all have different prices relative to the price of Bitcoin, of 100,000 Satoshis. And my thesis is that the lower the price, the more useful, and the more useful, the lower the price. And that utility comes from, majority of it comes from mining fees. The speed with which and the cheapness with which a transaction can be added to the network. And on Bitcoin, mining fees are done by weight, by the size of the transaction. It's not by the value of the transaction. Okay, this is important to understand. The field in a transaction that determines how much Bitcoin you are sending to another person 
is always the same size in terms of the data size. It's always eight bytes, which means that you can send anything from one Satoshi, although you can't send one Satoshi, you need to send 546 Satoshis. You could send anything from one Satoshi all the way up to the entire 21 million Bitcoins in a single transaction, and it wouldn't change the size of the transaction. And you are charged, the mining fee, you are charged by the size of your transaction. The size is really determined by the complexity of the transaction. How many addresses are you sending to? How many addresses are you sending from? And how much calculation are you doing in the sending? So you can have a little more advanced scripts and less advanced scripts. But the most basic transaction is going to be what we would call one input, one output of a pay to public key hash. So that's the most simple and smallest script that you could do. Paying also into, well, actually the smallest would be to pay into a pay to uh, script hash, but we'll say against that. One address in, one address out, uh, one input, one output, that's the smallest. And whether you're sending a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin or five cents worth of Bitcoin, you're gonna pay the same amount to the miner. And this helps us to understand actually what the native currencies are. The native currencies are basically, they are your access to the network. It's a common good. The network is a common good. So you need to prevent people from abusing it. So there's a cost for you to put a transaction on the network. And the people who are doing the consensus, the miners, the people who are uh, participating in actually building the network and keeping it connected, you're going to pay that to them. And so Satoshi actually envisions, and he says in the white paper, that mining will eventually end and it will go all to these fees. So what do we have? We have every block, every 10 minutes, some miner is going to be able to add a group of transactions into the history, the ledger, the blockchain. And each one of those transactions is going to pay a fee. And the miner is able to collect the fees on all of the ones that he includes. And so he has an incentive to include them. So this is how you avoid the tragedy of the commons. This is how you avoid people spamming the network, abusing the network. All right. So view it as your access to the network, your ability to participate in putting transactions onto the network. You're going to have to pay this. We see this even more so with Ethereum, and this is the thesis even works for Ethereum here, the thesis that I'm talking about. Uh, because Ethereum, you're not really charged by the size necessarily of the transaction, although it does have something to do with size. It, it, there is a correlation. But what you are charged for is the complexity of the transaction and how much computation has to be done in to put it onto the blockchain. So we're talking about smart contracts on Ethereum. These are like little scripts, little programs. So how complex of an operation do you want to run? The more complex the operation, the more of the base token ETH or Matic or Tron or whatever you have on an Ethereum clone, the more of that gas, that native token, you need to add into your transaction, the more you need to send. And again, the miners or validators, as the case may be, the, the nodes that are building the blockchain, every time they include, they get to keep that. Okay, so this is again the commons. So now here comes the thesis. Here comes the understanding. What we've got is we've got every time the, those fees get high, here comes a fork that clones it. So this happened with BCH. But you could also say to a certain degree, LTC, Litecoin, was an initial version of that, although it wasn't done for, um, for fees necessarily, although the fees stayed low. And then people said, oh, you just use Litecoin. That was the big narrative of the BTC people. Just use Litecoin. Use Litecoin for your transactions. With Ethereum, we saw this also with Tron, and now we see it also with Polygon, Matic to where Polygon is an exact clone of Ethereum. It's an exact clone. And the whole entire reason for Polygon's existence 
is because Ethereum's fees, the gas fees, became too high. And so it ceased to be useful. And so they created a clone where the fees were very low and it's more useful for doing the same things, particularly for sending stable coins, particularly USDT and USDC. That's been the main use of Polygon. And this is why in the last bull market, we saw OpenSea, instead of saying, okay, onboard yourself to OpenSea, the NFT marketplace, onboard yourself on Ethereum, it was onboard yourself using Polygon. Okay, so Polygon is actually the same phenomenon as BCH. The idea is that whenever the fees get high, you're going to have a clone that comes up. So again, all things being equal, because the, the lowest fee amount that you can pay is one Satoshi per byte on Bitcoin. So the same transaction size on BTC is many, many times more expensive to send than it is on BCH or on eCash or on BSV. And you can just as easily send $1 million worth of BTC onto an exchange as you can $1 million worth of BCH onto an exchange, be able to trade there, be able to trade it for dollars or whatever. But the fee to do so is going to be always much less on BCH or eCash. And the same thing goes for Polygon. Because right now, if I trade USDT on most exchanges, and I want to withdraw that USDT into a wallet, usually it'll tell me, oh, you can choose between ETH, Matic, AVAX, Tron. Right, so I can send it out. I can also send it in. I've got my USDT wallet on an exchange. If I send in with Polygon, five USDT, five USDT gets credited. If I send in with Ethereum, five USDT, five USDT gets credited. But to do that send on Ethereum costs me more than to do that send on Polygon, meaning Ethereum is less useful for that send because it costs more. It has more friction. Friction, cost is a friction. So that's all things being equal. All things being equal, the most useful network will have the lowest exchange rate on its native token. And all things being equal, the lowest exchange rate on the native token is an indication of the usefulness of a given network. Okay. So this becomes very, very important if we're going to understand and have a better idea of this number go up thesis and what, where it will stop. Because it necessarily says, think about what it says and how it, it tears apart the number go up. The network that would become the money of the world network is necessarily the most useful network. And the most useful network has the lowest native token exchange rate. So maybe the number goes up on BTC, but it will be about a collectible. It will be because BTC is a collectible. And what do we do with the collectible? We don't touch it. We leave it in the wrapper. A collectible is by its own nature unused. Its value comes from the fact that it's unused. So then you have to ask yourself, <laughs> what you know about collectibles? Is an entry into a ledger a collectible? That's what you got to think about for the number, for thinking about number go up. So now as we understand what's the most useful thing and what we should be paying attention to, now we can move from here and start talking about what we're going to see and where we should be looking if we're looking at what's going to be the most successful thing in Web3.